Too. We're rolling. Hi, who are you? I'm Helen Daly from Colorado College. Thanks, welcome to Rome. Thank you. Uh, tell us about your project here. So my project, Modeling Sex and Gender, uh, what I'm doing here is trying to get away a little bit from the metaphysics and semantics of sex and gender and instead talk about uh, what it would be like to model that. So what I mean by a model is something like, I think of sex and gender as a sort of um, a phenomenon out there and a model as a way of simplifying what's going on. And so we use models to represent to ourselves um, the important features of some phenomenon. And I think with sex and gender, this can be really useful because it can help us to resolve conflicts and make difficult decisions about um, issues that come up when we talk about sex and gender. So here are some models. The first three I kind of find out in the world already. The binary model, of course, is the default one. Um, the spectrum model, I think, is increasingly commonly in use. And the discrete categories one, uh, Sorry, can you say just a little bit about what each of those models yeah, are? So, yeah, so the binary model just divides people up into two exclusive and exhaustive categories, men and women. The spectrum model treats people um, as falling somewhere on a spectrum with respect to masculinity and femininity. So we say it's, it's kind of vague. Some people can be somewhere in the middle. People vary by degrees. And I think that captures something that the binary model doesn't. So it's an improvement. The discrete categories model here shows up um, in... A couple of early feminist work well, 90s, right? Um, but the way it divides people up is into discrete categories, but it, and these are my names, Th those don't show up anywhere. I mean, I'm thinking of it in terms of modeling, so I'm giving stuff names, but um, so it treats people as falling into categories, but not just two, maybe a whole lot, maybe just three. And the reason why that's an improvement is that it doesn't depend on just one feature like the spectrum model does, where it says you fall somewhere on a single spectrum. Instead, lots of different things can be relevant to that. And also, it preserves the, these useful categories, because sometimes we do want discrete categories to talk about people. Um, yeah, so, but my model here, I think, gets all the virtues of the others, and it increases the complexity, but, um, but what it does, it captures the, uh, the vagueness, but also the different kinds of features that are relevant by saying there can be many different strands along which people vary. So different kinds of features of our personalities and our bodies that make us either more masculine or more feminine. And we can vary so that we're feminine on one and masculine on another. So you use the word relevant at one point. Uh, I take it part yeah. of the idea is you think different models are relevant in different contexts. I guess I yeah, so can exactly. I just ask uh, somewhat briefly, you had an example involving women's athletic competitions. You had an example involving uh, transgendered students applying to women's colleges. Can you say a little bit about how your model works with those sorts of cases and does that help illuminate the distinction between your model and some of these others? Yeah, I think it does. So, um, yeah, so I think of the different models as being applicable in different cases, but the many strands model, I think, also can capture the others. So there's, um, I, I call it all-encompassing over here. The, the way I'm thinking about that is like, if you wanted to represent the binary model using the many strands, you could say, there's only one feature relevant in this context, and instead of treating it as a spectrum, I'm going to treat it as discrete. And that, that's an option, the model gives you that flexibility. But what this really has going for it is that in practical cases that are really hard to decide, I think this model shines because we can do things like, um, well, see, we've got a question, like deciding who can compete in women's athletic competitions. That's really tough. Um, it matters a lot, it's kind of, I mean, it's high stakes, like people's lives will change a lot depending on whether they're permitted to compete in those competitions. It's also really offensive, I think, to tell someone that they're not a woman when they identify as a woman. Um, so it matters, and we don't want to uh, screw this up, right? Well, this model doesn't function as a substitute for good judgment, but what it does is say, look, there are lots of different features that might be relevant. So think about why it is that you want to categorize people by um, sex or gender at all. And in the case of women's athletic competitions, you might think the reasons are something like um, that we want to uh, celebrate and encourage women's athleticism, um, we want competitions that are fair. Um, those are the kinds of things that might matter. And then what features are relevant to that? Well, um, probably some physical features matter. Um, gender identity might matter too. And so we have to think about what we think is most important, like what actually, like if testosterone is really super important for determining your athletic ability, then we might really care about it. 
Um, uh, oh, I'm sorry. If it's not, then we might not. Didn't mean to interrupt. Um, I'm curious about whether you feel like there were uh, any particular questions that came up when you were talking with people, or examples, or claims that. Uh, and uh, I'm gonna step away for one second. But talk as if I'm hearing. Yeah. So, um, so one thing that came up that I thought was pretty important is that a lot of people are really concerned about um, including features here other than gender identity. And I think that's a really important concern. So um, so a lot of people think that gender identity is actually all that matters and we shouldn't talk about other features and we shouldn't be judging from a third personal point of view what someone's sex or gender is. We should allow them to define themselves. And I think, you know, I'm really sensitive to that concern. Um, actually, I think that's, that's almost exactly right. Except there are these special cases where occasionally other people do get to decide kind of for you how to define you. And the reasons are because, like I said, in athletic competitions, you know, we're concerned about um, celebrating and encouraging women's athleticism and we're concerned about fairness. Those things matter. Or like in your, um, in the example of a women's college, it, who gets admission to a women's college? Well, that's not the sort of thing where we want to say whoever wants admission to a women's college can get in. We do want it to actually have something to do with who's a woman. And so I think in certain rarefied, uncommon contexts, it's important for people to be able to say other features are relevant. Um, and it's okay in those very rare circumstances for someone else to decide who counts as a woman in that context. It's always limited in that way. It's never like, um, across all contexts, I've decided now and forever who counts as a woman. But, um, but yeah, so, so gender identity is one of those cool things that I think people are really sensitive to and concerned about in important ways. I got a lot of, like, uh, a lot of pushback on that. Uh, interesting, interesting. Okay, uh, well, thanks for taking the time to talk to us, and well, uh, look forward to seeing you at future rooms. Yeah, thanks a lot. All right.